And that would mean that things like algae, uh, floating microorganisms, would have a pretty tough time. They'd have a cold winter and a warm summer. They'd have a tough time living. This means that there was probably not the kind of food around that filter feeding organisms needed in order to exist. The best place to live at that time was right on the sea floor, eating whatever settled to the bottom of the sea floor. Now then, in the Cambrian, the situation began to be slightly different, apparently. There are three major different kinds of Cambrian uh, faunas, com fossil communities, if you like, across the world. Whereas in the Precambrian, we can only identify the Ediacara kind. This seems to indicate that the, that massive Precambrian continent was perhaps beginning to break up into pieces. And as it was breaking up into pieces, the conditions became somewhat less extreme in terms of climate around the coast of those pieces. And this gave an opportunity for organisms to begin to develop filter feeding because algae would be able to thrive in those more stable conditions around the smaller continents. And they would be able to provide the food for early filter feeding organisms, but still not very many filter feeding organisms. And then in the Ordovician, the real fragmentation of that early Precambrian continent was finalized. We had several continents in the Ordovician, and around the, those small pieces of continent is where the filter feeders finally had their heyday, so to speak. Algae weren't, were able to thrive in the water around those small pieces of continent. They provided the food for the filter feeders, and suddenly there was an opportunity for filter feeders to thrive. And that's why we think the filter feeders came into their own in the Ordovician, and to continue that way through the, uh, through the Paleozoic. Now, you'll remember at the end of the Paleozoic is the time that Europe and North America collided to give the Appalachians. And the creation of Pangaea, that supercontinent of the Permian, reversed the situation that we've just seen, to, seen develop. The continents glued themselves together again, so to speak, became welded back together in one supercontinent. What happened? Well, at the end of Permian time, when the land masses were all joined back together again, conditions became, we think, more extreme, the climatic conditions, and the, uh, where the life for, for algae became more difficult because it became more difficult. There, was, there were fewer algae in the water, and the filter feeders began to die out. And in about five or 10 million years, at the end of Permian time, we see a massive extinction of many, many different kinds of filter feeders. The brachiopods, for example, which were filter feeders of the late Paleozoic par excellence. Very many brachiopods had a really hard time at the end of the, the Permian. And the same goes for some of the carnivores. There was not so much in the way of um, <clears throat> life in the seas for the carnivores to eat. So they had a hard time, too. So what we're seeing is that the movement of the continents and the, uh, the kinds of conditions that maintained, that existed in those shallow seas around the continents, was largely responsible for the conditions under which organisms had to live. And because they were responsible for those conditions under which the organisms had to live, then they governed the kinds of organisms which were able to survive and adapt to the, uh, uh, to, the, to the environment. The supercontinent of Pangaea broke up in the middle of the Cretaceous to give us the numerous small continents that we have now. And as conditions became more stable, more oceanic, if you like, once again, the filter feeders had their heyday. The main filter feeders at the present time are the bivalve mollusks, the clams that we find in profusion on our seashores. 
One very important group that's present throughout the fossil record from probably the Precambrian with soft-bodied relatives right up to the present day are the echinoderms. It's a very important group and we ought not to leave our discussion of fossils and their relatives without having a look at the mode of life and the variety of the echinoderms. The skeleton of the sea star when it's alive is quite flexible. Respiration is carried on through many skin gills distributed amongst the spiny knobs on the outside of the sea star. Oxygen diffuses through them directly into the body of the animal. Movement depends upon a kind of hydraulic system. Water enters through the so-called sieve plate at the top of the animal and flows into the ring canals and then into the radial canals in each arm. It finally reaches the many tube feet under pressure. It causes the tube feet to extend and the little suckers at the end of the tube feet hold onto the substratum and the combined action of the many tube feet then propels the sea star along. At the tip of each arm is a tiny tentacle, especially sensitive to touch, and there's also a patch of light-sensitive cells, the eye spot. The starfish is a carnivore. It eats flesh, and it seldom has much trouble in catching its prey, the almost immobile clams. But sometimes it has more trouble. This scallop is not an easy meal. Sea stars sometimes lose an arm, in which case they're able to very quickly regenerate another one. Sea urchins are rather like walking pincushions. Their rather glob globular body is covered by spines, and between the spines are tube feet, which enable the sea urchin to move. The sea urchins are scavengers, and the mouth is a rather vicious-looking instrument composed of five claw-like organs. The sea urchin is bisexual, and the male and the female can be readily induced to release the eggs and the sperm with the application of an electric current. This makes them very useful in studying the mechanism of fertilization and embryonic development. The stream of sperm is gathered up here in a pipette and added to egg cells and examined under the microscope. The sperms are here fertilizing the egg, which quite rapidly divides into two within, in fact, about 24 hours. The developing embryo becomes free of the membrane of the egg and moves around by means of little cilia, little whip-like organs, and eventually becomes a free-moving blastula. The larval development that the present-day echinoderms show is different from that of other invertebrates, and that's probably one of the most interesting things about the group. It suggests that perhaps the echinoderms are somehow special, and it's even been suggested that they have something to do with the origin of the vertebrates. Now, our understanding of fossils at the present day is, as you, I hope you've seen, quite sophisticated. We can do important things with fossils.